Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, this is the final part of the unit having to do with the executive branch. Uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> the role that the president has with regard to the public um, and kind of his public per his public persona. Uh, and then the second part uh, should have to have to do with the president and his relationship uh, with the media. Um, so let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, Lincoln said pretty famously that with public sentiment, nothing can fail and without it, nothing can succeed. Uh, and really what he's talking about is, is the way that the president relates to and kind of communicates with the public. Um, so much of his, of his perceived strength or his perceived power uh, has everything to do with the way that the media perceives the person and the way that the, 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 the way that the public perceives the office. Um, for instance, uh, Abraham Lincoln signing the Emancipation Proclamation in, into into effect um, without public sentiment on his side, without public support for that move, um, it would have been exceedingly difficult uh, for him to do it or for it to be successful. Um, really, it, it just it further illuminates the reliance of the president on public support, uh, on having that relationship with the public to where. Um, they have a little bit more, a little bit more influence and a little bit more power um, with driving the uh, direction of the country. Um, presidential power is the power to persuade, maybe best illustrated by President Johnson, as you see here. Uh, President Johnson was notorious for um, using his physical stature to persuade those that he was that he was having conversations with. He would stand uh, right up in their face and kind of make his physical his physical stature an intimidating thing for them in order to to convince them that he in fact uh, was on the right side of a particular issue um, but he is far from the only president um, that used his office and used his presidential power uh, to persuade or to convince um, those around him those in congress the public so on and so forth well, one of the ways that the president serves uh, the public or kind of uses the the office publicly um, is as a head of state right so here you can see uh president obama speaking at the funeral for nelson nelson mandela uh, as our head of state he represents um he represents the american government and the american people uh in these international settings um, the same is going to be true uh when when the president accepts or hosts different uh, world leaders um, at the White House, whether that be for some sort of a social event, a dinner, whatever the case might be, um, in that particular in that particular instance, or in those particular instances, rather, uh, the president is serving as the head of state. And, and a lot of times, what we see from this from these ex these events are are pictures just like this one. You're probably familiar with things like this, right? Uh, the president accepting teams that have won championships, whether that be at the collegiate or professional level, to the White House. Uh, the team typically presents the president with a jersey. Um, yes, the the president is is serving as the head the head of state in this particular uh, event or in moments like these. Um, but they really um, go out of their way to embrace these duties in most cases um, for a couple of reasons. One. If, if you were ever going to um, use the position of president of the United States to interact with groups of people you otherwise might might not, this is a pretty good example. I mean, frankly, in what other situation are, are, are Barack Obama and Urban Meyer going to going to have a conversation? Probably not very often. Um, but really, it's it's nothing more than just fantastic press. It's good PR uh, for the president. It makes him makes that person look so much more relatable when they're interacting with um, student athletes, when they're interacting with athletes of any of any variety, um, and they're just taking the opportunity to shake hands, to take pictures. Uh, it's a perfect a perfect opportunity um, for the president to really just be the happy smiling face of the nation so um they embrace the heck out of these duties because it's a great opportunity for good publicity for them maybe the best example of a president t seizing the moment and, and using the the uh, opportunities that they have as head of state to curry some favor and to um gain some good publicity uh is is shown in this video president bush's first pitch um, at the world series after 9 11 our at Yankee Stadium after 9/11, I mean, man, th this is probably uh, one of the best examples of the president um, using one of using a moment, taking the opportunity as the as the 
head of state as the the figurehead of the entire American government and really uh, the representative around the world of the of the American people. Um, and taking the moment to signify American strength, to signify American unity, to signify American values uh, after an absolutely uh, horrific event had taken place and to kind of signal to the world that we're, we're still here and we're going to stand strong in the face of this terrorism. Um, for my money, this might be the most influential moment of George W. Bush's entire presidency. It's either the bullhorn speech that I showed you in the video yesterday um, or the day before or this first pitch at Yankee Stadium. It is such a pivotal and such a, a powerful moment, uh, not only for those in attendance, but for those watching on TV. Uh, I, can remember, I can remember watching this on television when this happened. Uh, absolutely, absolutely remarkable stuff. Um, because the president's uh, influence and power is so heavily linked um, to public support, they very closely monitor their approval ratings. Uh, for, for most of, of the last three, four, five decades, um, presidential approval ratings have been shown on some sort of some sort of chart uh, that looks like this. Now, I use President Obama's because it's the last full term president that we have. Um, and given the current circumstances, I, I don't know that a global pandemic is really the right time to um, weigh in on President Trump's approval ratings, either for for good or for bad. Uh, I think it's it's much more fair um, to look back over the long haul uh, and talk about it uh, kind of in 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 total um, but because the president is so reliant uh, on the perception that the public has of them um, they very much uh, are aware of and monitor their approval ratings closely and the question that Gallup asks is do you approve or disapprove of the job being done by the president of the United States and in this particular um, graph, the approve bar, the approve number is is the black line there, uh, and the disapproved number is the red line there. So um, you can kind of see the change over time um, during President Obama's presidency as well. If you look at um, the last, or uh, if you look at a, a extended group of presidents, so we have two, four, six, eight, ten, ten presidents here on this chart. Um, you should be able to see a little bit of a trend. Um, and that is, for the most part, they all go down. Um, uh, other than Clinton, who builds a little bit of momentum a, a, as he moves forward, for the most part, they all um, they all go down. And what that should is indicate to us is that the president does get at least a little bit of a honeymoon period, um, whether that be at the start of Kennedy's presidency, uh, where his approval rating is up in the upper 70s, or, or um, even something, even somebody like George W. Bush, who his approval rating starts at at the upper 60s, um, he enjoys a little bit of a honeymoon period before ultimately his approval rating comes back down to earth. And that's not unique to George W. Bush. So obviously, the same is true uh, as you see of Reagan or Carter or Nixon, Johnson, Kennedy. I mean, it, it happens to all of them. Uh, but the president absolutely enjoys a little bit of a honeymoon period where the public is much more forgiving, much more willing to say they approve of the job that he's doing early on in their term. Typically, um, that, that honeymoon period doesn't last very long. Again, using Obama as the, as the kind of the guideline here, because he's the last full-term president that we've, that we've had, um, you can see that at, at the start, um, his approval rate is up in the mid, mid to upper 60s. And, and by the time you get into um, 2010, it's already down into the low 50s or mid 40s range. So that that honeymoon period is a really, really short amount of time uh, for most modern American presidents. Uh, one of the things that impacts uh, presidential perception um, is the is their status as a lame duck, right? So if if the president loses an election, loses a, a re-election bid, um, there is that window between when the election happens and when in inauguration day takes place, uh, where they're termed a lame duck president. The same would be true um, if you are a second term U.S. president um, after election day. So um, in 2016, after election day, after President Trump had won the 2016 presidential election, from November of 2016 to January of 2017, President Obama was serving as a lame duck president. Uh, when we're talking about presidents, it, it has to do with election defeats or term limits. Um, in some cases, if, if you're talking about congressmen, it can also 
it can also have to do with them talking about retirement. Uh, but but that lame duck status often leads to presidents and government officials, elected officials, uh, being perceived as weaker because they quote can't keep up with the flock. Um, so uh, a lot of times, even if, even if the president has a very high approval rating, you'll see them start to be a little bit less uh, aggressive in in whatever it is that they're trying to accomplish during that lame duck period. Another concept that we need to be familiar with when it comes to the president and his um, interactions and influence with the public is this concept of a bully pulpit. Uh, the bully pulpit is first brought into the American lexicon uh, by Teddy Roosevelt, um, and he, he uses it to make reference to the White House uh, being essentially a platform that president can use to promote their agenda. Um, they basically have more access to American voters, to the American citizens, um, than anyone else in the country, right? If the president decides tomorrow that um, he wants to address the nation, he can get a hold of the network heads and he can get 30 minutes on national television tomorrow night and suddenly address um, the entire country. Nobody else has that authority. Nobody else, or nobody else has that power, the ability to all of a sudden communicate directly with that many American people. Um, a lot of times the, this term bully pulpit uh, has a little bit of a negative connotation because it really um, is used used by the president to exert political pressure, right? It, it's, it's using the office to exert political pressure on people that are opposing uh, maybe a legislation that you're, that you support um, or maybe just to exert political pressure on, on the, uh, the opposing party. Uh, but whatever the case may be, this, this idea of a bully pulpit often has a negative connotation in American politics. Five modern presidents tend to be regarded as, as excellent communicators. They're the great communicators of our time, as, as identified by your textbook. Um, and really, most presidential historians would, would agree on this list. Now, when we say modern presidents, we're talking about people uh, from the 1900s and the 2000s. Um, so the five that make the list uh, are these five right here. FDR really um, is, is the first of the modern presidents that we would identify as a great communicator uh, because he introduces the fireside chat in which he directly addresses the American people by radio um, during the Great Depression. The second being John Kennedy, uh, pictured on the bottom left down there, um, and his, his role as a great communicator, or the reason that he gets that title of great communicator, uh, is, is very evident. If you go back and you listen to a Kennedy speech, um, it is passionate, it is articulate, and you combine that with the fact that he's a good looking dude and it's the first president in the age of television um, and his ability to communicate and grab the attention of the American voters uh, becomes pretty obvious. Uh, the next one, Ronald Reagan pictured there on the top, right? Uh, Ronald Reagan uh, probably owes his, his, his ability to communicate with people to his acting career, which is one of the positions that he held prior to entering politics. Uh, but he, he much like Roosevelt um, used media to speak directly to the people on a, on a weekly basis uh, through, through most of his presidency. Um, and, and it was his ability to speak to, to voters and speak to citizens um, in a way that made them feel like he was just, he, you know, he was just your intel, your your wise old grandpa that wanted to sit down and talk about about budget deficits or or whatever it might be. Uh, but a, a fantastic communicator as far as using the office of president to to communicate with the American people. Um, next, Bill Clinton. He has a little bit of an all shucksy side to him. Uh, he's that accent, uh, that that Arkansas upbringing showing through and making him feel very relatable um, to to voters and to to citizens uh, through most of the early 1990s. Yes. The Lewinsky scandal certainly has an impact on the uh, perception of Bill Clinton um, towards the end of his presidency, ultimately in the time after he leaves office. And then the most most recent, uh, President Obama, um, much in the same vein that you see um, people refer to or, or talk about Kennedy speeches, um, there, there are some definite similarities between Kennedy and Obama uh, in the way that they are they deliver a speech the language that they that they use um their ability to grab the attention of and hold the attention of a crowd uh, and then also uh, maybe maybe most importantly 
their willingness to utilize a new form of media, right? So for President Obama, that would be um, social media, um, putting out different videos, 60, 90 second videos of him um, delivering a message, much in the same way that Kennedy benefited from the use of television. But those are our five um, great communicators in modern presidential history. And the last piece inside this idea, or inside this this relationship between the president and the public, uh, is the idea of mobilizing the public. So mobilization mobilization of the public it may be the ultimate weapon in the president's arsenal of resources that he has to influence Congress. So if if the president really wants a piece of legislation to be passed, um, say maybe in the case of President Obama, you're talking about uh, you're talking about the Affordable Care Act. Um, maybe not the best example because it doesn't have a doesn't have overwhelming popular um, public support but the president is able to use that bully pulpit to mobilize the public to get the public to to listen to his ideas and say wow uh, the president's got a really good idea about health care or about immigration reform or about tax reform or whatever um, and the public then starts reaching out to their uh, congressmen or congresswomen and, and expressing their their thoughts, saying, "Hey, I know we voted voted you into office, and we'd really like you to support the president when it comes to immigration reform, tax reform, health care, whatever it is, right?" But that's what that's what the authors of the textbook mean when they talk about mobilizing the public. All right, last piece: the president and the press. This should go fairly quickly. Um, the president and the press, or the White House and the press, has a little bit of an adversarial relationship. They're they're and it's pretty e pretty easy to understand when you think about it. Um, presidents presidents are policy advocates, right? I mean, they aren't they aren't just open books willing to share any and all information at, at any given moment. I think the current circumstances uh, probably make that as clear as anything. That um, politicians are a little careful in what they're willing to share with the people in some in some cases. Uh, but the president <clears throat> wants to control the amount of information going out. He wants to control the timing of the information that's going out uh, about the, about his administration, about the work that they're doing. And the press really has no interest in moderation. They want all of the information they can have as quickly as they can possibly have it. Uh, and, and as a result of that, the relationship between the White House and the press can, be, can certainly be adversarial. Uh, about one third of the people that work uh, in the White House staff, the high-level White House staffers, are directly re directly involved in some form of, some form of media relations, uh, whether that be on television, uh, social media, on the uh, working with the news the news websites, working with radio maybe a little less prevalent now, um, but a third of all high-level White House staffers have some some relationship or some involvement uh, with with the media. The mouthpiece for the White House uh, is the press secretary. Now, in the current uh, administration, the role of press secretary was probably most famously filled uh, by Sarah, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who has since left the position. Uh, but the White House press secretary is kind of the liaison, again, the mouthpiece for the White House. Any information that the press gets typically comes um, during the, the, the press briefing, uh, which at one point were held every day or in some cases multiple times a day. Uh, President Trump has been significantly less willing um, to use pref press briefings in the way that, that previous presidents had. Uh, so if you're interested in what the press secretary does, there's a nice little uh, video here that makes it fairly, fairly, fairly clear what that person does. The best known interaction between the president and the press is the is the briefings in which the president is is actually in attendance. The president does not enter does not attend every briefing uh, at the White House. It's not not he isn't he is not going to be present at every press briefing that takes place. Uh, but if there's some sort of big event going on, there's some sort of um, massive piece of legislation being pushed out. Typically, uh, the president will appear at those briefings and take questions um, from the press at that point. So those formal press briefings really are the, are the big moments um, where the, the president directly interacts with the media. Um, it, again, those press briefings happen on a daily or in some cases more than daily basis, twice, three, twice daily, three times daily basis with the press secretary. Press secretary um, but the, uh, the president does attend when, when called upon. The White House offer, off, 
often issues press releases if they have some sort of uh, big announcement or some sort of policy shift um, and, and they're not really willing to take questions on the matter at that point a lot of times they'll issue issue a press release um, so maybe a maybe some sort of natural disaster happens typically the first thing that that the white house will do will is they'll issue a press release with a statement from the president and then they'll follow that up um with a press briefing shortly thereafter but the press release tends to happen first uh those press briefings and, and any interaction between the president and the press typically you'll see the president lean on sound bites yeah and we talked about sound bites when we talked about the media in our linkage institutions unit uh, but Sound bites are are the way that the, the president kind of lives in that briefing room. Um, you're never going to get long, drawn out, very detailed answers in a press briefing, or really uh, in most interactions between the media and the president. You're going to get sound bites. You're going to get the things that um, turn into good headlines, the things that turn into good 30 second segments on a on a news sh on a news show. Um, so sound bites are a big piece of of the president's interaction with the press. News coverage of the presidency is so often negative. It is overwhelmingly um, negative, the, the way that the White House and the way that the president is covered. Uh, if you look at, if you look at the overall media coverage um, from the last uh, the last presidential debate cycle, so in 2016, and you have um, the three top Republicans and the two top Democrats there on that chart, you can see uh, the amount of negative coverage those candidates received far outweighed the amount of positive coverage that they received. Um, again, the, the press part of this was extremely brief because we covered so much of it when we talked about the, the press during our linkage institutions uh, unit. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to get a hold of me. Um, I would be more than happy to answer anything that I can. Other than that, have a great day, and I will talk to you guys soon.